Vatnik Soup is a Twitter thread series created by Pekka Kalioniemi, introducing pro-Russian actors and propagandists from around the world. This includes so-called independent journalists, politicians, military personnel, and of course, just regular grifters looking to make money. The series has introductions and deeper insights on how online propaganda and disinformation works in its spread. There are now 200 Vagnet soups, and it's taking a short pause for now, which introduce bad actors along with the strategies they employ to pollute the information space. As Pekka states, the first victim of war is the truth, and Russia considers itself at war with the US and its perceived vassals, the collective West, EU, and NATO. Pekka has a PhD in interactive technology and is an expert on social media platforms, algorithms, and disinformation. He is a NAFO activist and runs a series on Kremlin assets, agents, and oligarchs called Vaknik Soup. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Silicon Curtain podcast has been created to explore the issues around propaganda narratives and techniques and the threat they pose to open societies. If you like the work we do and you enjoy our speakers, please do like, share, subscribe, and consider becoming a patron to support the work we do. Pekka, it's delightful to welcome you back to the channel and for the second time. Yeah, it's good to be here. And uh, we had a key anniversary recently, and that was the you pronounce this nonsense, not me. Um, and that's become a bit of a bit of a strap line, hasn't it, for the NAFO movement and actually for anybody uh, trying to counter uh, ridiculous Russian propaganda. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, it has become this kind of catchphrase for NAFO. Uh, what what was the name of the the Russian diplomat who who tweeted it? Uh, was it Dimitri? I don't I don't remember his name, but I think it it started from there and uh, it, it kind of became this uh, slogan for the whole movement. It it was wasn't it? In fact, um, he's uh, this particular individual. I will look him up in a minute. Um, he's uh, he's produced quite a few of uh, of the uh, the NAFO memes. Actually, he's quite a a fertile source. Yeah, he's called me a propagandist, so uh, we've had a little interaction on Twitter. Ah, well, it's uh, Mikhail Ulyanov. Exactly, yeah. That's the guy there, and he is a Russian diplomat. And unusually, yeah, he, he, he responds, but in a particularly kind of inept way, which is kind of fun. Um, <clears throat> now... Vatnik Soup, it's taking a little bit of a break, but you hit a key milestone of 200. And by a curious coincidence, I hit 200 interviews last week. So we're sort of right. celebrating a certain milestone almost at the same time. Congratulations on 200. I know it's a lot of work. I know it now because, I, I, I mean, for you, it's even more work because you do videos. So I, I can, I know how much time goes into production, editing and that kind of stuff. So. It's, it's a lot of work. I wonder, I think actually you probably put more work into each individual Vatnik suit because now, now I've got these sort of 200 scripts, I can kind of dip in and recycle some of the questions and the editing. The editing is relatively simple on interviews. Uh, if it's sort of straight to camera, like, you know, the longer videos that say Vlad Vexler does and so on, it probably takes about 20 times the amount of time to actually script and edit the straight to camera pieces um, mm -hmm. than it does interviews, which is, I think, but you do a lot of research, don't you? Because you're really putting a lot of information about individuals out there. And there's always the danger that they're going to, you know, find uh, that you've perhaps, uh, you know, propagated a, a full sort of something and, and sue. So you're perhaps a lot greater risk and your research needs to be robust. Did you, did you have that sense when you were doing them? Yeah, of course. I mean, you have to be careful uh, what you say because, well, as a uh, if I if I claim to be a disinformation researcher, of course, I also have to be really careful that I don't really share mis or disinformation. So yeah, you have to be careful. Uh, I do corrections if I'm if I'm if I if if there's some fake news over there or disinformation so or misinformation so. It, it things need to be corrected, but I think the problem there in social media is that it's so fast paced that these corrections usually 
they are not noticed. So people people don't see them. Uh, it's a problem because they already have this idea in in their head uh, that something happened, and it's kind it kind of it's it gets stuck in their head, and it's very difficult to change their mind after that. Uh, so. In that sense, you need to be even more careful because of the fast pace of, of social media in general. Uh, and uh, for some reason, we tend to believe pretty much everything that's written online, which is kind of weird, uh, weird thing. So uh, it's very easy to spread conspiracy theories, uh, uh, propaganda, yeah, which is, of course, something that the Russians noticed a long time ago, that it's a very effective medium for, for spreading lies. And it's a, it's an interesting parallel, isn't it, with the emergence of radio as a technology? I think people forget that radio was relatively new. And there was a period where people believed everything they heard through the medium of radio as well in, say, the 1920s and 1930s. And it coincided with the rise of fascism again. Uh, you know, these these concentrations of very bad ideas. And radio was a key tool in that propaganda, um, possibly slightly less so in the Soviet Union, because I don't think radios were quite so uh, numerous uh, amongst the population but certainly in in nazi germany is this a feature of new technology that people don't develop the culture and understanding uh to be sort of you know cynical enough or to interpret the narratives because now people would approach radio with i would say a relatively sort of cynical mindset it's uh, and it's also a minority medium yeah probably and i i feel like also when you have a new medium or technology uh, uh, so-called bad actors or let's say propagandists they always try to kind of put themselves inside there just so that they can they can uh, try and spread their message so it's like these um, it's like new territory and these pioneers come and try to claim as much of the land as possible which in this case is the information space. So they try to kind of establish the main narratives so that they can control the environment. Uh, and uh, that's basically what Russia did uh, 2013, 2014, when they kind of claimed the information space about uh, first about the opposition of Russia. Then when that was um, under control, they moved to Ukraine and to the West. So they kind of claimed this territory that was... Uh, free to take for them and they 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 did it in a very clever way so that people didn't really realize what was going on until it was it was not too late but it it still took a long time for for the western societies and democracies to kind of realize what's going on we're being controlled here and that's an interesting process isn't it because for many people the physical threat from russia has only really become apparent with the full-scale war crimea georgia uh, these conflicts didn't trigger uh, a sense amongst the majority i think of people that russia was on a mission that russia was engaged in this aggression against us and in fact you know it's been apparent i think for the last decade almost that russia considers itself at war with the west and nato certainly since the paranoia um, really intensified in Putin's regime from 2012 onwards, but a lot now protests, you know, believing that color revolutions were a Western political technology and we were aiming it at Russia. Uh, I think um, that is that is fanciful to put it to, to put it to, you know, mildly. Um, but it suggests your idea there that, that this war has been engaged primarily in the information sphere, but it's really moved into a sort of hot war uh since since february last year um and gone unnoticed i mean how is that surely our security services surely our governments uh would have paid attention to that or do you think they've willfully ignored it because of you know self-interest and uh, economic interests yeah i think i intelligence service probably noticed all this but uh maybe they didn't want to kind of interfere with the democratic process of or free press of of that's that we have in the West, so and free speech. So it's it kind of becomes this struggle between free speech and uh, malign actors doing their information operations in the information space. Information space. So what kind of how do you weight them? Uh, which which one is more important 
because once the information operations become powerful, they can they can uh, they are a threat to the national security, of course, and to the stability of the democracy democratic countries. Like in, we we see this massive polarization of of people in the United States, which is probably the most extreme uh, example of. Uh, Basically, you have two parties and they are on each other's throats all the time. And uh, there's always, uh, always, there's this big war, ongoing big war on the information space. So who who can kind of defame the other party more? Uh, it's, to me, it's a very negative approach uh, to politics, but it's... It is what it is, but I think uh, in the States we see it's an example of an escalation of this kind of hybrid warfare and when it works really well. And of course, it costs money. That's the other aspect, isn't it? So even if Western governments to acknowledge that they're in a state of warfare, informational or otherwise, to counter that would cost a lot of time and resource because the disparity is that on the Russian side, we don't exactly know the numbers, but considerable money uh, is put into dominating the information space. And then we'll come on to the subject of your Vatnik soups, because these guys aren't doing it for free, are they? You know, to maintain an, mm. a hostile ecosystem, it costs a lot of money. Do, do we have a sense of, of how much and how it's distributed? Or is that pretty murky still? And we have some numbers, but like from uh, Project Lakta that was uh, in the 2016 U.S. presidential election, we have we have the numbers there. But I mean, it's I, I feel like it's just the tip of the iceberg, uh, and it's it's a big business. It's not something like there's a, this secret base in Russia where it's done. They basically buy these. It's you can buy it from buy troll farm activities from Philippines. You can buy buy it from China. Uh, Indonesia. So you have a lot of uh, Africa. It's a, many African countries have a big, big troll farm. So it's just a service you buy. And then you provide them the narratives and they can help you with that. So, okay, you now you have to praise Putin or you have to say that the West is uh, decadent and we are on the brink of uh, like existential crisis or something like that. So it has just become a regular service you can buy uh, from companies or uh, so it's the numbers i mean of course we can make estimates or guesses but i don't i think it's impossible to say how much money is actually involved and i, I would say that um many 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 countries are already buying these information operations from troll farms so mm -hmm. uh and i think uh the, the big problem here is that we are it's kind of an asymmetrical battle because Russia, they they can always, they they have Roskomnadzor, which is kind of the censorship service. They can always close down websites if, if it seems that they become too uh, anti-Russia. But if, if if we kind of try to do this in, in if, if in Finland, uh, the government just decides, okay, let's close down Twitter because there's too much anti-government message. It, it would be a riot. So it's just kind of the system where uh, basically... It's much easier for them to conduct these operations because, uh, and it's much easier for them to defend themselves against these operations because they can just say, okay, let's close down this website for a week because they wrote some nasty stuff about Putin. And same in China, of course. Uh, that was going to be my point, was that uh, Russia is not the only player engaging in this large-scale troll activity. It is one of the most aggressive, and because it has an active war... That information has a particular, uh, let's say, pointedness to it. Um, but China will on, undoubtedly be involved in sort of mass pollution of the information sphere to protect its interests. I've heard from uh, sort of uh, colleagues and friends in those countries that there are extensive troll farm networks in uh, Serbia uh, and Bulgaria as well. But these wouldn't just be engaged in in political activity they would also be farming out their services um quite literally as troll farms uh on a commercial basis won't they so they'll probably be mixing it up working for commercial customers you know um maligning competitors etc uh for gain uh but also engaged in either local or 
in the case of Russia, you know, larger geopolitical activities. So it's a kind of commercial operation. It's not purely focused on politics, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's a very cynical system. It doesn't really have any kind of morale. So we, who is paying? We work for them. Uh, and you can always find a troll farm that will work for you, whatever the... the uh, kind of a subject or is or the target so uh and uh, also israel is very big in this information operation uh, uh this i don't remember the the name of this big big company that just got kind of caught uh, uh on on conducting these operations and uh, they these were literally like hybrid hybrid operations so they also worked in real life so for example they uh they sent um, an escort to some politician's house and somebody took pictures of that. So you, they, they kind of do these very sophisticated hybrid operations where you work both online and then in, in real life. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of money to be made there. I mean, there's always money in politics. There's always money in, in I don't know, uh, when you consider big companies, uh, it's and for countries, information operations are quite cheap way to kind of defame your opponents. So that's why they are being conducted on a large scale. Compared to missile systems, compared to tanks and training armies, it uh, it's an incredibly economical activity. I think uh, you know, I've spoken to a number of my speakers there who who talk about that sort of economic advantage of information warfare. Um, and of course, even when hot warfare begins, the information warfare doesn't cease. It carries on and sometimes intensifies. And one of the best examples, I think, uh, is the Internet Research Agency uh, based in St. Petersburg. Um, and that infamously was created by Yevgeny Prigozhin. And that suggests a very interesting mechanic because, you know, Yes, he won that contract because he has you know, close associations with the Kremlin, et cetera, et cetera. But he also won that contract, uh, we believe, because he was able to create a very economic model. He was able to say that he could deliver better results uh, at scale at a lower cost and more sustainably. So, you know, and he's done a similar thing in the army. OK, the tactics aren't particularly uh, sophisticated, but he's shown that his uh, troops are more effective, leaner. Uh, and get better results than the uh, much more sclerotic and, uh, you know, full of administration and hierarchy sort of main army in Russia. So he's brought a certain business economy and sensibility to the art of information warfare. Um, do we do we know that much about Prigozhin and the operations of his troll farm? I think um, it was uh, a fellow Finn, Jessica, uh, Jessica Aro uh, did an extensive study on that um, and, and got a lot of uh, troll kickback as a result. But I think from her book and her studies, we, we know quite a lot actually about the functioning of the troll farm as a kind of economic mechanic. Yeah, I mean, uh, it works like it, it's kind of like this uh, mass production of information or like a factory setting. So people work in... in uh, shifts so you have like a 12 hour shift and you you uh, produce pro kremlin basically the rules uh when when yes jessica did the the research was that you the only rule is that you don't talk bad about putin so that's you have your main narratives but you can you have you were quite freely you, you could quite freely kind of express yourself uh but uh, just don't talk bad anything bad about putin that was basically the the only rule um uh, and uh yeah they had quotas you have to it's like you work in a factory you have a quota and they had the same thing uh the salary salaries were actually quite good uh to by russian standards uh and they employed a lot of journalists a lot of uh university students who didn't have a job like uh academics uh and so you had this quite intelligent group of people who were just basically pro producing pro-Russia anti-West propaganda, but also uh, they were creating uh, kind of 
contradicting narratives so that people kind of got confused so they they could be there could be writing a pro black lives matter messages but then tomorrow the next day they could be writing anti black lives matter messages so you have this kind of uh uh confusing messaging uh, uh, which also creates and increases this polarization that is quite evident especially in, in the united states now, you must have noticed over your 200 Vagnet soups, we'll come to some of the individuals in a minute, but you must have noticed considerable troll activity because very quickly your Vagnet soups gained a huge audience on Twitter. Um, you have also uh, been in the news. You've been able to get really good sort of PR coverage um, in the press of what you do. It's very, very uh, relatable and writable, as it were, um, and it's an interesting topic. What have you noticed about the troll activity in relation to your your um, you know publishing that you've been doing over this last year? Uh, you mean against my my writings? Uh, yes, or... yes. Did you, did you yeah, notice any so... sort of patterns or angles oh, yeah. in the troll activity? Yeah, I mean, uh, there are people who try to uh, kind of defame me. They try to imitate my style of writing. Uh, uh, I've been attacked. Uh, my academic achievements have been attacked. Like uh, I'm, I'm an average academic, and so on. So, uh, but I think in general there hasn't been that much uh, kind of a tax against me. There's there are uh, there's quite a lot of negative feedback uh, when when I write about a specific person so for example uh, after i wrote about trump there was a lot of uh, negative feedback or people who defended him a lot of uh, elon musk defenders uh, came kind of uh, they attacked me after i wrote about him but it's more about uh, and of course putin that was there was a lot of uh, negative feedback after that but um yeah, I mean, in general, it's been mostly positive uh, feedback. So, but it's also, I think, it's also something that social media does to us. It's we we are inside this our own information bubble, and it's very difficult to penetrate. So we have this uh, group of people who mostly, uh, for example, I have a group of people who mostly enjoys my content. So it, it doesn't really reach those people who are who disagree which is a one negative side of in uh, of of social media are these information bubbles which are hard to pen dif difficult to penetrate so we we kind of just talk to people who we agree with most of mm. the time i think as well it's true to say that uh, prior to the full scale war uh, the trolls could really hone in on anti russian or you know, anti-Putin comments because there weren't nearly as many online. There weren't nearly as many people, uh, you know, speaking out. Um, you know, channels like mine, threads like yours didn't exist. Um, so when someone like Jessica Aro pops up, you know, she's one almost solitary voice. Uh, and so, of course, you almost instantly attract uh, a, tra a cloud of, of trolls and they can put a lot more resources, time and effort into tackling that one sort of lone individual. Now there are so many, you know, and the Russian opposition um, for, fled to Europe. Uh, they've set up their own channels, radio stations uh, or Internet stations in Vilnius and around uh, the Baltics. So there's a lot more critique, isn't there? Um, and. You know, I remember when uh, Skripal happened, the poisoning of Skripal, and going back even further to Litvinenko, being on Facebook, if you were to say anything sort of critical, and in the first 24 hours of the Skripal poisonings, I was like, well, this is quite clearly um, uh, the Russian state. I mean, there's literally no question in terms of how it was carried out, in terms of the supposed chemical that was used in Novichok, you know, there's no, no, way, no way a private actor is going to get hold of this. And almost immediately, I had a, you know, a whole ton of of quite sophisticated trolls, all with fake identities. And if you go and you check them out online, they've gone to the effort of creating fake websites. Uh, they've gone to the effort of of taking the profiles of academics from, say, Swiss universities. And, you know, they've crafted proper alibis for these trolls. Um, 
But now there's just too many voices, I think, for them to uh, to pursue online. Yeah, I mean, um, Russian oper- information operations have always worked uh, uh, with a high volume approach. So they do, they provide a lot of uh, content, but these days it's more, much more difficult because they, they also, like you have movements like NAFO that have also, that are also very effective in this high volume approach. And it also works very well because it kind of ridicule, ridicules the, 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 the opponent. So uh, it's very difficult to have any kind of uh, uh, constructive discussions when basically, well, uh, you take an, if you take an example, somebody like um, Russian diplomat says something that is uh, obviously uh, a lie or disinformation. So why would the why why would we have a discussion uh, on that? It's it's much easier to kind of ridicule that your the the messenger rather than like focus on on the obvious fake message like the bioweapons labs or uh uh ukrainian neo-nazi government or whatever whatever the narrative is um uh, nato proxy war it's much easier to kind of uh it takes a lot of time and effort to try and uh kind of build arguments and build this uh yeah, the set of arguments against against the claim because it takes time. It, you need to do a lot of research. It's very easy to, to make a claim, but to kind of argue against it, it takes a lot of time. Uh, so NAFO is there kind of to, uh, it's like a, this quick solution against this kind of, um, if I may call it bullshit. Uh, so uh, that's why it works really well. And it's just kind of uh, using the same tactics that the Russians have used for, for many years. So high volume uh, approach is it's, it's quite effective on social and, media. And there's a nice there's a nice little sort of uh, they occasionally put out guides uh, in the NAFO movement. And that is you find your Vatnik, you find your Russian target, your source of bullshit. Um, you whack them with a meme. You make a couple of sort of, you know, sharply pointed comments, but then you don't engage in debate. You move on to the next one. So there's even a kind of strategy designed to counter, you know, the main thrust of Russian propaganda. And it is pretty effective. Yeah, and even it's it's like, a, as I said before, it's this uh, cynical approach. But uh, sometimes you the, the only counter to cynicism is more cynicism in, in, in this sense. I mean, of course, these narratives have to be argued against. I mean, if, if Russia claimed that there are bioweapons labs in Ukraine, you have to kind of, somebody needs to do the research and do a counter. But uh, in this fast-paced uh, social media environment, you have to do something before that. You kind of have to have a quick answer. So... Uh, that's why NAFO works really well. Uh, and uh, that's exactly what the Russian uh, information operations have been and propaganda have been doing for a long time. So they kind of uh, swarm the opponent or just uh, drown uh, the the arguments with, with bullshit. Now, that's why I think humor is particularly effective because you might not have all the evidence all the factual evidence to counter the propaganda argument but a well-crafted meme is like a little missile of humor that takes down or punctures the idea of russian propaganda without uh, you know and you can do that before you actually have proofs this is one of the problems i think in mainstream media especially the bbc where they have to wait until there is absolute concrete evidence uh in order to move away from the whole two sides thing so the first response for traditional media is to be a little bit sort of disconnected, to have two sides, to sort of, is it this, is it that, etc. In the meantime, propaganda has got all its points made, you know, far, far faster. And when the facts become available, as in the Kahovka Dam uh, incident, uh, it could be weeks, months, even MH17 years before there is enough evidence to say, OK, we definitively now know it was Russia. Everyone's moved on by then. Propaganda has done its damage and people aren't paying attention when the facts come out. 
So do you think this sort of quick fire humor is 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 the ideal or the only way actually to counter um propaganda at sort of lightning speed at the speed that it works for like right now i cannot think of any better solution i mean it's not the ideal solution but it, it works in in this kind of fast-paced environment uh i think another example is the Nord stream uh sabotage which is like who gets to put out the big narrative big big uh explanation the quickest so who get who like russians basically came out with Cy Hirsch. So he had this uh, theory that was full of holes that is now being used by every pro-Kremlin actor. It's like, okay, so it was it was the US actually. And then uh, the United States had their own, or New York Times had their own theory that it might've been a group of Ukrainians. But then there's something that people don't really know about is uh, the uh, Danish, Swedish, and Norwegian journalists, uh, they tracked boats uh, or vessels that uh, went through that were close by the the sabotage these uh sabotage areas like just a few days before it happened and these these boat this boat had a uh, submarine capabilities so i mean and almost nobody knows about it because it took time to do the research and then when it came out there is this docu- great documentary called the shadow war uh that is put out by by these uh, uh journalists Nobody really cares anymore because most people have made their mind. So it's uh, it's either the United States or it's it's Russia basically, and uh, there's not really any sophisticated dis- uh, discussion or argumentation around it anymore. It's just basically people have already made their mind, and it doesn't matter what the the final conclusion coming from the journalist is because it's it's ancient history when you consider like the the. Uh, social media environment and people actually, have moved on to other things it's like nobody's talking about the the submarine and titanic submarine that that got destroyed we already have new stuff to talk about that's it and the propaganda the conspiracy theory is already bedded in isn't it it's already is a, then able to deflect anything that comes later because people have as you say settled in to a certain mindset or a belief and just for clarity that um that boat that passed through with uh you know submersible capabilities that was that was russian wasn't it yes it was russian yes, yes. exactly sorry about that that's a crucial thing to mention to mention it. There. yeah 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 you don't want to get the russian norwegians thing. into trouble or something <laughs> yeah i think you can find the documentary on on youtube with uh, english subtitles if people are interested uh, the shadow wars or the shadow war We'll find find it and we'll pop a link into into the video. Now, you've covered a lot of Vatnik soups. Now, there's 200. It'd be good to go through the types of people because, actually, I did a little bit of work here. I created a spreadsheet of your Vatnik soups and I characterized them by, uh, and we'll go through that characterization in a minute. Um, the data head in me wanted to go a lot further than that, but I've done a basic kind of gender, you know, nationality kind of breakdown. Uh, also, the sort of types of people. I think that's quite interesting. But the sort of people you're covering are famously litigious. Um, Kim.com, oligarchs, they have the resources and they have the intent to sue even if they know they're not going to win. And there's been a recent case with uh, Catherine Belton and others where actually they've used and weaponized the court system, say in the UK, to silence journalism, to put pressure on newspaper editors. Have you had any sort of scary experiences with either being taken to court or, or threatened with uh, with legal action? Well, Kim.com uh, said he would sue me, but nothing came out of it. It was funny because uh, some of the Finnish pro Kremlin actors said that they're gonna they're gonna also take part in this. Uh, what is it called when it's like a big group of people? Class, so, class action. Yeah, so they're gonna they were gonna do, but they they didn't realize that it doesn't even exist, and you cannot do it in Finland. So. They were just, but I haven't had any letter from anyone. So basically, it's just all talk and no very little action. Um, but what has happened in Finland, for example, is we have the Finnish broadcasting company called Ule, and uh, their uh, director was sued in Monaco. So uh, by uh, 
by an oli Russian oligarch. So what they're now doing is they're doing kind of this, uh, they try to find the courts where they have the best chance to get a good re end result. So because they can they can claim that, okay, because internet is kind of this global space so, and it affects people everywhere. So they can pick the country where they can do the the, the court case. So now they're doing it, uh, some of this in Monaco and so on. But uh, for, I think against me, it would be very difficult to win a court case because what I do basically is I collect information from around like different different spaces uh, or different uh, sources, uh, and then I just kind of uh, refer to the whole. The kind of I collect information and put it into a neat little package that people can kind of digest. So uh, I don't really see it happening, but I mean it's just a, tact a scare tactics basically, and it worked for a very long time in London. But I think it's uh, after. Uh, Catherine's book it has kind of uh, they haven't had so many cases anymore and of course after the full-scale invasion it's been much more difficult for them to kind of take this kind of uh, action too but uh, yeah I think it's it's still something that the the rich oligarchs can and will use because it's it's it it's not expensive for them uh, it doesn't really take any any resources from out from them, but it's a it's a big hassle for the people who is being sued because well, you basically you need a need a lawyer and, and uh, it costs a lot of money and so on, and it's it's it can be very uh, devastating to the person who's being sued. It's stressful, isn't it? it? Interrupts the activities that you're doing, but also you need to go and you know crowdfund probably uh, resources because I'm guessing that neither you nor me could uh, go out and just hire a, you know, a top flight lawyer without uh, some serious public support behind it. So I'm, I'm a little careful, you know, we don't do uh, exposés on this channel. Um, that's it. it. It wouldn't survive. I think uh, an oligarch uh, taking us to the cleaners, but let's get into, into the detail because I think, there's an interesting breakdown of the data. I didn't share this across, um, but you may already have some sense of this. And let's start with gender. So certainly when we look at the Vatnik soups, and, and you have taken, I think, a, a really good cross-section of the ones out there. So I would say you're, you're almost certainly not, not very biased, actually, in your choice, because you've got really strong coverage right across. But what we see is that around 80% of the Vatnik soups are done on males, um, less than slightly under 20% on females. Now, why do you think there is it skews so strongly towards male voices? It also has to be said that many of the female figures, there are a few foreign ones, but actually that figure is significantly bumped up by the Russian propagandists because they do have some, uh, you know, like um, Skibera and, and others, they do have quite a number of females there. If you took the Russians out, we'd be closer to sort of 90, 95% uh, male. Now, why do you think it skews that way? Okay, I'm going to do a little bit of theorizing or speculation. Um so a lot of uh, so most of these people come from a marginal they come from uh, like fringe from the fringes and uh, how do people go to those fringes or marginals they often feel being let down by society they might feel disenfranchised so they they feel like they don't have any kind of say inside the society they what they do doesn't matter and this kind of and they also often feel anxiety about what's happening around them so they kind of marginalize because of that they go to i don't know 4chan anonymous social media uh, uh, platforms where people agree with them and they, they kind of start often start creating these conspiratorial ideas like uh the the globalists are trying to take over the world this kind of like conspiracy theories uh, uh, men are more uh, prone to kind of being affected by conspiracy theories so i would say that this could be it just speculation so maybe maybe these marginals these fringe fringes are it's it's they I, they're probably male dominated in that sense so it's easier uh, to kind of uh, convert people from from these uh, fringes uh, to work, I don't know, for pro-Kremlin actors or kind of produce uh, 
pro-Kremlin propaganda. Some of them are not even paid. They just do it because they've been kind of uh, sort of brainwashed, uh, useful idiots. Some 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 use this term. Um, so uh, maybe maybe it's that. Uh, and I think in Russia there is also a tradition, especially with precocity. There's this tradition of using. Um, females who have been maybe they've had some criminal past in the west or uh, like Mira Terada uh, for example and then they are kind of uh, turned into propaganda weapons inside Russia so they can say that I was uh, for example I was tortured in an American prison and uh, uh, I was put in in prison for for no reason I didn't commit a crime or anything like that and then they they are very powerful uh, pro Kremlin propagandists after that and precaution likes to use this this tactic uh, and uh, Chapman another another example who who the the illegal uh, and Chapman who got caught in America and then sent to Russia as a, as a spy and uh, she, she's now a propaganda weapon used in Russia so Russia uses this tactic a lot so uh, they they uh, so but anyway I I would feel like uh, uh, the, oh sorry my my opinion is that uh, or I speculate that males are more prone to kind of drift towards these marginals where it's easier to kind of recruit people to spread uh, Russian propaganda. And that's interesting. I think that ties in. If we go on the theory that <coughs> if we go on the theory that they choose propagandists because it aligns with their target audience, I think the data we're going to go through sort of shows that actually it's not random at all. You know, they're clearly picking the channels or routes to get to the audience. So it makes sense that if you're marginalized individuals who are perhaps more vulnerable to this information, predominantly male, then in Western countries, Global South, etc., you're going to have sort of male propagandists to appeal to them. Whereas in Russia, you're looking at more of a cross section of the population and you're trying to engage everybody, especially, I think, in some ways, females who are you know, the average population we're looking at here is watching state TV news is going to be, there's going to be a lot, a very high number of so females in there, sort of 50, 60 plus. Um, so you need those female anchors to speak to them. And that perhaps explains the sort of skew we see here. And another interesting thing, if we turn to countries now, when we went into this, I would have assumed that Propaganda still works pretty well in, say, China, Global South, so-called, etc. I would have expected to see an awful lot more uh, propagandists there. But actually, when we look at the figures, the number one at 27 percent, 28 percent, actually, is U.S. Then we have Russia. Then we have Finland. I mean, that's probably skewed because of your, your research. I know a lot of your little what, initial ones there. Then we have UK and then we have Ukraine, Canada, etc. What it seems to be doing here is following a pattern not of the countries that are more susceptible to propaganda messages. It seems to exactly align with who Russia considers to be its main enemies. Um, I mean, that should be obvious, I guess. And as this is a propaganda weapon, of course, they're going to be targeting those countries, those entities that offer the greatest resistance. But it's so interesting to see that the data actually aligns that way as well. Do you think they're consciously, you know, structuring and putting resources into, um, you know, trying to target their main perceived adversaries? Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, maybe first uh, I should say that, for example, there aren't any any botnik soups on Brazilian actors, which we, there are a lot of blind spots. There aren't any African, uh, anybody from African countries. Uh, so there is a blind spot. Uh, I've, I've written about the Global South, how it it's it's a big target of, for example, Wagner operations. And at the same time, of, of course, Prigozhin's Internet Research Agency and this kind of troll farms are working there. So there is a clear blind spot in, in the Global South, uh, but it's also a thing I just don't have. Uh, the knowledge I don't really know the culture that well I don't I don't know the the language that well so it's very difficult to start to kind of 
approach these areas so that's also uh, one one explanation why they they lack but i mean why um they are targeting the united states so aggressively in my my view is that most of the money to aid ukraine comes from there so they try to target uh if you look at uh and also i i i've kind of put a lot of emphasis on american actors because their kind of narrative uh, or goal is to reduce or stop the military aid to ukraine because that is basically the most number one most important thing that's uh keeping uh, well, that's helping ukraine is the the american money and the weapon weapons so they try to affect that once if if that goes away then you try ukraine will be in deep trouble uh especially with with like if they start after they start to rebuild the country they they need a lot of help from the united states that's that's a that's the truth uh, uh so they are targeting united states very aggress aggressively because uh the big the biggest share of of the aid is coming from ukraine uh, so that's probably the reason why why they have such a big and also uh, as i said before the the polarization in the country it kind of enables this so because there are people who are like basically fight there's so much infighting in the american political system so it's very easy to kind of provide these uh, propaganda weapons to to some of these actors like uh the maga gang or trumpists and so on so uh they can use it like okay uh they are sending all of your money to ukraine so we don't have work we don't have food our inflation is because of ukraine and so on so it's also an interesting point i mean if i put my uh my hat on as a marketeer as well i think if we dig beneath these information uh, operations and we see them as a kind of economic model if we compare them to how you know commercial marketing works you're not going to go out and create the same kind of units doing the same job for every single country every single region because that's not economic and you would then almost inevitably have considerable overlap they'd independently you know come to to many of the same sort of conclusions the same narratives so what you would do is you would find a master region a master market you would create your narratives craft them innovate them there and then you would copy paste as it were you would then disseminate them down and it may be that once you get to um you know middle east or wherever it could be that sort of you take your us narratives and 80% of them still work fine. So you just reproduce them. And that's a very economic model for, for rolling the information out. You might then need to add in, say, you know, 15, 20% of local narratives to appeal to a local nuance and so on. So if we try to break down that economic model, what we're seeing here makes sense because even though we have limited information on Middle East, et cetera, um, and I know some studies have been done it, but it generally it's kind of very much ignored, even by uh, you know analysts who who do this sort of hundred percent of their day job. Uh, there's not enough sort of time to do it. One could assume though that a lot of the methods pioneered when they're disseminating this information in U.S. and Europe will actually be sort of recycled and trickled down into uh, into into other countries. Yeah, when you when you consider like behavioral sciences, there are almost all humans react to strongly to something. So uh, when we start talking about children, when we, uh, for example, uh, um, one failed narrative, Russian narrative was the organ trade that's happening in Ukraine. So people, uh, these Ukrainian doctors are harvesting organs from uh, children. And so it's it, it's basically that it's a business. Uh, uh, so it's something that kind of resonates with everybody. I'm happy that it failed because it was it was a terrible narrative. But uh, if it's if you know basic psychology and behavioral science, like so, it's very easy to kind of create these narratives that affect most people. So we can we can choose some themes that are uh, that we react strongly to, regardless of. Of, of geographics or culture or whatever because it's they they're like these primitive uh things that just kind of create a strong emotional reaction in 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 most people 
but yeah, it's 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 copy paste in many ways, and um, often it has failed, like uh, this anti woke thing that uh, Russia is the traditional uh, family value country, and then you have this decadent West where you don't know what gender you are anymore, and so on. So it's it doesn't work everywhere, and that's uh, they they've kind of tried to copy paste it, but it just doesn't work in in many countries. And uh, there are other narratives that just don't work. But um, well, I have a I had a great conversation with a Czech uh, researcher called Josef Holy, who said. Uh, we we kind of discussed so what's going on in Finland and what's what's been going on in Czech Republic and it's like it's exactly the same stuff it's the the the, the whole process and the whole narratives have been almost exactly the same uh, from coming from uh, from pro Kremlin actors so and that's that's actually really good news isn't it because where you have a distributed um, much more horizontal kind of chaotic NAFO movement, you can actually be far more reactive country by country. Uh, you don't have to necessarily take the copy-paste approach. So it's interesting to see some techniques emerging, um, which actually perhaps can potentially do a better job um, and, and don't rely on the sort of vertical of resources coming from the top down to generate that activity. Rather, they're more of a horizontal from the ground up you know, not require. In fact, they don't even have any centralized resource, unlike the, uh, you know, the the assertion that uh, NAFO is run by the uh, CIA and there's a whole, uh, you know, warehouse of people banging away on uh, on keyboards there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's this decentralized approach is that's why NAFO is still there. Um, if you if you consider many previous social uh, and also an anonymous which is even older so they don't really have any central uh, central central figures or uh, hierarchy it's just anonymous so they still exist uh, it's small smaller scale than before but still they are there and uh, nafo is, is is the same thing it's because there are no leaders and there shouldn't be leaders uh which makes it so effective. If you, for example, Konyi, I don't know if you remember this, there was this uh, African warlord who's actually still alive. Uh, and uh, they started a movement against him in 2012. And uh, it, then they collected a lot of money. The movement became huge. It became viral. And then the the kind of the leader of the movement started doing some crazy stuff and it, the whole movement just kind of died down. Uh, really quickly and no nobody remembers Connie anymore he's still there in the, in the African jungles uh, as a warlord but uh yeah so these decentralized centralized movements are very effective yes and they and they uh, fortunately you know individuals are fallible and yet uh, you know many people involved in NAFO have 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 you know uh, has been shown to have some sort of slightly dodgy connections or some people at least, um, but that doesn't take the movement down, which is fantastic news. Well, the the last kind of data analysis I've done here is to break down the types of individuals that are represented, um, and this is using your classification here. But the biggest one, which uh, uh, sort of twenty two percent, is classed as information. So these are people who simply exist to propagate information, now, whether that information is right or in the case of propaganda, typically wrong. Um, perhaps it's not so surprising that information experts are the biggest source of disinformation. Okay, I'm gonna, I, I think there's, uh, so if you look at the information category, it's actually uh, information that I've written on, on uh, propaganda. So it's, it's not, it's, it shouldn't be like a, person category it's like what i've written about so uh it's not really a category of of these people uh, per se but it's it's more like uh okay i'm, I'm gonna write information about troll farms about how uh how propaganda is spread on social media and, and so that on. makes sense that makes sense well the, the first human category then after that one is politicians uh, and again, perhaps this isn't a, a huge surprise here, but just under 20 percent, so 19.6 uh, percent uh, is politicians themselves. Uh, then we have journalists. Then we have businessmen. Uh, 
And then we get into sort of the the, the more niche categories we'll come to in a minute. But it, it's no coincidence is it, that politicians, journalists and business people are the largest sources of the uh, Vatnik soups. Yeah, I mean, politicians, they make policies, they make laws. So it's it makes sense to... Uh, it makes sense to try and affect their worldview. And uh, also, if you have politicians who are in high places, they are listened to. So when, when for example, if Donald Trump says something, hundreds of millions of people will listen to him. So it kind of tries, it's always, uh, it's always kind of, it makes sense to try and uh, kind of turn these people to work for your cause. And with journalists, it's it's a loose term. So a lot of these people are so-called independent journalists or citizen journalists who don't really have any education to be a journalist, or they just write, or they have a fake news blog, or or something like that. They they write op ads for Russia Today or RT or Sputnik, or so. It's 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 kind of kind quite a loose term so who who is a journalist and who is not but these people often call themselves journalists uh, or uh, independent journalists citizen journalists investigative journalists so they are kind of they claim to be doing something that the main main so-called mainstream media is not doing so they dig deeper they, they okay so i for example, somebody goes to Donbass in East, Eastern Ukraine and they go, okay, people actually love Russians there. And so so it's, it's this propaganda uh, thing. The word independent is uh, is horribly abused in that sense, isn't it? Because... Exactly. It's the most misleading <laughs> term you can use. Um, then we come to the sort of niche categories, and, and there's probably not a huge amount uh, here that, that is surprising. I'll just list a few, but there's one I think that is especially interesting. Uh, but you have TV presenters, you have political commentators, political analysts, bloggers, streamers, etc. You have debunkers. You know, these are obviously people who, uh, uh, you know, conspiracy theor uh, theorizers who, who love to sort of propagate Um and uh, you know falsehoods, etc. But the interesting one for me that pops out in this in this sort of uh, this sort of uh, lower tier, as it were, uh, is soldiers. There seems to be a significant number of soldiers who are pushing these propagandist lines. Um, what what emerged or struck you when you were sort of producing those profiles? Um, so, yeah, I guess you kind of have to divide. Most of them are either you know, American soldiers or Russian soldiers. So you have Igor Kirkin, who is obviously a Russian soldier or mercenary uh, who basically works for money, but who is now doing anti-government uh blogging uh, against uh, in in Russia so but in, in the American soldiers they are a very interesting category in 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 my view because most of them uh they've been kind of mistreated in the army or in the navy or where they worked they've been um so you have Scott Reader for example who was kind of uh, defamed for his views on on Iraq and so on so he worked there and uh he he was kind of ridiculed by the by the by the government and by by the army and by by his associates, so uh, probably feels kind of bitter and let down by his own country. Another example is Douglas uh, McGregor, who was also a very uh, creative uh, strategist and analyst. Uh, but maybe a little bit too creative, and uh, he kind of he was uh, is the term stonewalled or like when you cannot get any promotions anymore. So he 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 didn't get any promotions in the army. So basically, his career in the in the U.S. Army was over. So now he's doing commentary on RT. Now he's doing pro Kremlin taking doing pro Kremlin takes on on different podcasts and so on, and he makes the most ridiculous claims on on. Uh, troops and uh, like uh so how many ukrainian soldiers have died for so he, he's saying that 400 or 300 thousand ukrainian soldiers have already died and so on so it's it's something that they probably feel bitterness and uh they feel being let down by their own country so they kind of turn against it against them at the united states 
And there's an interesting mechanic there, because if I look at the commentary on my own channel, I mean, it is sort of 98% positive. Then you have sort of 1% that I would say is negative, but seems to be organic. I mean, there's a lot of negative organic commentary. I say a lot, it's only 1%, it's quite small. But what I tend to do is engage with those because, you know, it's interesting to actually explore that negativity. And it may be that, say, someone is a, you know, a radical Trump supporter, et cetera, but they still appreciate some of the things on the channel. So I engage positively with those. And then there's the other 1%, which is definitely sort of troll activity. And they seem to fall into two buckets. One is abusive, negative, and I just block those because it's, you know, there's no value in those to anybody. But there's a far more subtle propagandist technique. And that is to say, oh, you know, I quite like your material, except that, you know, this bit and this bit and this bit where you've definitely got it wrong. And one technique they will often use is to appear like they're doing a positive critique. But they will then put links. They'll say, well, I think you got this wrong. Why don't you look at? And then they'll put links and names, et cetera. And actually, most often, they will be citing the general that you talked about. Not He's not a general, is he? Uh, McGregor. They'll be citing him. They'll be citing Scott Ritter and several others. And it seems that these are the go-tos because they think that people will see as a military figure that there's authority there. And there'll be some deference to somebody who's been in uniform and served their country. So it's very interesting the way they try to you know, twist or turn people towards other propagandists rather than necessarily trying to make the whole argument themselves. And I think this is how the mechanic, this is the value of uh, those kind of propagandist figures. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's it, it's much easier to point to American analysts rather than, okay, there's this Russian uh, mill blocker or whatever that disagrees uh, so it's it, you have this kind of contrarian people who are against the the united states government they're very anti-establishment they're anti-nato uh, a lot of this kind of uh, contrarian view so uh, but to me it's just uh incredible how okay i'm gonna say gullible how gullible some people are because these people have been proven to be wrong over and over again. I mean, both of them said that the, the whole operation in Ukraine would be over in three days. And then it's been, what, a year and a half almost, and it's still going on, and they're still doing their analysis, and it's still very uh, anti-Ukraine, anti-West uh, and th still they are being referred to, still they are being listened to. So if you have some kind of, if you if you claim to be an expert on something, I think you would have need to be right at least once to have any kind of credibility. But these people, they are like constantly wrong and they, still they are used for, for these propaganda purposes. To me, that's, that's incredible. And there's a classic quote. I actually took a screenshot of this, and I'm, I'm, it's great that you've touched upon that because there's a classic one here from George Galloway, who is a British politician, and and actually he's got quite a more complex persona than just sort of pure propagandist, which is why so many people, you know, really uh, are attracted to him. And he said back when you know British intelligence were warning that Russia was doing a full scale invasion, but before it had actually kicked off, he says. You all said Russia was about to invade Ukraine. I told you it wasn't. You were wrong. I was right. Again, show some bloody humility, especially if they're not even paying you to act like an idiot. Now, this was February the 14th, 2022. We know that shortly afterwards, the full scale war began. Did George Galloway turn around and acknowledge he was wrong? Did he show some humility? He absolutely didn't. And this is this is to your point. I mean, they throw this stuff out. It's accepted. And then it's almost like there's a collective amnesia. People will move on to the next narrative, the next, the next, the next. And the propagandists never apologize for their past mistakes. They never reference their mistakes. They just supersede one lie with, with another lie. Yeah, it's uh, there's no... You don't really have to... Uh, care what you said before i mean people i mean 
I'm I'm glad that people are throwing this stuff at uh, at his face like still today like NAFO NAFO commenters and so on. So it's it's uh, but he doesn't care. It's it's something like is it accountability? Like there should be some kind of uh, if you say something, you should stand behind those things that you said and uh, kind of say that, okay, I'm sorry, I was wrong here, uh, I apologize, uh, my analysis was wrong, but you you will never see any of this from, from Fox, Scott Reader or McGregor or Galloway or whoever you, almost anybody you take from the list. So that's that's just how it works. Now, my last question here, and this is uh, in a way sort of a, a plug, really, for your next project as well. Um, out of all of the Vatnik soups, I'm wondering which your favorite ones are. And in fact, you're about to launch a YouTube version, uh, a YouTube format. Are you going to be taking the most interesting Vatnik soups and you know expanding on them, adapting them for your YouTube format? Or are you still planning out what you're going to be doing on YouTube? uh so yeah i have i have the first three videos or so i have planned already so i'm gonna take a time machine and go back to october 2022 do some of the early early figures finish figures because uh, i find them very interesting so i uh, i'm gonna do videos on, on them um it's gonna be pretty much the same stuff but i want just want to expand i want to Put, I want to put it in like multimedia format. So you have video, you have pictures, you have charts to see the connections between people. So it's, it's just a little bit different. Uh, my favorite Vatnik is probably, I would stay, say from like Vatnik soup is probably Jan Mals Chong uh, because there was, it had a kind of a great story where he was completely different person before and then it kind of somehow changed so uh and also i would say kim.com because it just created this big 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 uh kind of show so there was okay i'm gonna sue you and uh and it it also made the channel uh, or the the my account much much bigger uh maybe one more that i would like to mention is the don't pass devushka one because it actually became it kind of bled into the mainstream media it, it was the first page uh, front page of wall street journal and so on so even though most of the research that was there was done by other people, with, by NAFO activists. Uh, so I'm still kind of proud of putting that together and pushing it out there. Well, that's brilliant. Uh, we're out of time. I want to wish you tremendous luck with uh, the YouTube channel. I know it's going to be a huge success as Vatnik Soup has been. And of course, I hope we see more Vatnik Soups in the future, because as we were discussing before we hit record, propagandists are like mushrooms. You know, they're popping up all the time there's still plenty of uh, people for you to do profiles on yeah thank you this was great the second time was i think it was even better than the first one so thank you for that that was a real pleasure Paco. have a fantastic weekend and i look forward to seeing the youtube channel and we will of course be sharing that around with our audience on this channel as well uh because i know they'll be uh, absolutely fascinated in the work you're doing on that all right thank you very much